Okay. We can just have the slides come up, please. Great. Well, thank you for coming. My name is Garrick Heilman. I'm a, an academic at the uh, London School of Economics. And um, I'll just go ahead and motion to you to advance. Great. So I'm going to talk about four things today. Um, the first, I'm just going to give you a brief kind of macroeconomic overview. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about what are alternative currencies. And then the two pieces we're going to conclude with are why do alternative currencies die? And what can Bitcoin learn from other alternative currencies? Is this okay in terms of me moving around for the camera? Or? Okay, great. Thank you. So if um, you only remember three things from my presentation today, um, please remember these three things. First, alternative currencies are nothing new. They've been around for hundreds, if not longer, hundreds of years. Second, they appear, they appear to proliferate alongside uh, rises in debt levels, which we'll talk more about in a second. This is a preliminary finding, so don't quote me on this. And then last, their lifespans vary significantly. And I think that's one of the really important questions to ask. Why is it that alternative currencies have such varied lifespans? So first, a macroeconomic overview. Um, so this picture here depicts what I'm calling the great sovereign debt divergence. It's a picture of the last 10 years of public debt levels for advanced countries, which is the top line, the white line. These advanced countries are like the US, the UK, France, Germany, versus emerging markets, so Brazil, China, is the black line. And you see a really big spread occurring, basically, in the levels of debt in countries in, advanced, in the advanced world versus ones in the developing world. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So if we look a little further back, and again, this is staying with advanced countries, this is a picture of public debt levels for all advanced countries over the last 120 years. And you can see that today we have world war levels of debt without the world war. Um, not quite as bad as World War II, but beyond World War I. And this could have important implications for desire, I mean, commitment to pay, basically. Britain, following World War II, which is a country I study very carefully, closely, had a very high level, uh, very high commitment to pay because it was a just war. Society wanted to pay back that debt. They'd fought the Nazis, they'd won, the debt was just. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. But public debt isn't the full story, as you probably all know. This is a picture of private debt. And as you can see, private debt actually for many countries is much, much greater than public debt. And the reason why this is important is that private debt actually becomes public debt oftentimes. We saw this with Ireland when their banking system went bankrupt. Uh, the debts of the banking system had to be placed on the government's balance sheet. Now that doesn't always happen. Iceland did something different. They actually defaulted or let their banks default. But private debts can sometimes become public debts, so you can't just look at the government debt levels. You have to think about debt in its entirety. So the big question in economics, the single biggest question is how much debt is too much? And Alan Taylor, who's an economist who I have a great deal of respect for, he's at the University of Virginia, says that basically we know that at some point the debt to GDP level, this ratio, has to slow down or fall. But if you go to an example like Japan and look at their debt to GDP ratio over the last half century, 50 years, it's been basically a steady increase over that entire time. So Alan, when does that day eventually come? We've already seen a half century of increases. Could it go on for another half century? Many a hedge fund manager has been put out of business trying to bet on when that day eventually is going to come for Japan, and it hasn't yet. So basically the bottom line is economists don't know how much debt is too much debt. There's no Good, and that good way of determining that with any degree of accuracy. But if we go to economic history, we can look at which country in history had the highest debt ever, and that was Britain in 1946. They had a debt to GDP ratio of 270%, which compares with about 230% that Japan has today, and the US roughly around 100%, just to put those figures in perspective. And interestingly, Britain did not default or have a hard default following uh, that very high level of debt. Um, and so I'm studying how they were able to do that in the way which 
we not, I'm not going to talk about here today, but basically they use something called financial repression to basically avoid default after World War II. So my study of Britain after the war has led me to also take a look at what, what are called parallel currency markets. So this chart here shows two things. The top line, the black line, is the official exchange rate of sterling and the US dollar. In the 1940s, one sterling note, one pound sterling note could be converted at the Bank of England or at the New York Federal Reserve for $4.03 until September 18th, 1949, when sterling was devalued by 30%. So that's the top line, the black line. The white line are the parallel markets. In this case, this is depicting the market in Zurich. And so sterling notes were traded both during the war until the market was shut down for about 20 months and after the war. And as you can see, the exchange rate in Zurich varied quite significantly. During the war, you can see it really bottomed in 1940 during the Battle of Britain. Um, you can see it climbing you know, around the time of things like Stalingrad. Um, and then post-war, it was really mostly about a 30% discount throughout. So it was this interest in parallel currency markets that led me to take an interest in alternative currencies more generally. And just to come back to this, this slide here, and we, we touched on this briefly at the beginning, one of the early preliminary findings I have is that it, tends to, it seems to be that alternative currencies tend to proliferate during periods of high levels of debt. We saw a great many during the Great Depression in the 1930s proliferate, these parallel markets in the 40s, and then really starting about 10 or 15 years ago, we've seen another increase in alternative currencies. So that's one stylized fact that you could maybe take away from this presentation. So now we're going to talk about money and alternative currencies. So if we can go to the next slide. Money, the standard definition, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is that it's a store of value, meaning it can be saved. It's a unit of account, so it's fungible. The dollar bill in my wallet is just as good as the dollar bill in yours. It's divisible. You can break it down. And last, and I'd argue the most important of the, the three, is that it's a medium of exchange, meaning that if you've got a cow, I've got a horse, I want your cow, you don't want my horse, money allows us to solve this double coincidence of want problem, basically that separates us from doing a transaction. So, next slide. So there is a literature, an academic literature on alternative currencies that I'll just briefly touch on. Uh, historical currencies like the Maria Theresa dollar, really fascinating tale of this Austrian coin that was circulated in North Africa for 120 years, long after it, it stopped being minted by the, um, the Austrians. Uh, it was still used in places like Africa. That's that's been covered. Um, the, the work that's been done more recently on alternative currencies by Tibet and North has tended to frame alternative currencies as a backlash against globalization. So that's kind of how they've been looking at it, which I don't think is the whole story. And then there has even been a few papers on Bitcoin in the literature. There was a paper that came out from some Irish economists, I believe, who were questioning um, how, uh, how uh, private really Bitcoin was, how anonymous was it. There was a paper from some Stanford professors or people who uh, were looking at how to improve Bitcoin. So, um, but there's some gaps in the literature. First is there's no gen generally agreed upon definition of what is and what is not a, an alternative currency. Um, the second is that you know, this current, the, the focus of literature, the recent literature, as I mentioned, has been basically on anti-globalization. A third uh, issue is the fact that there's just some flat-out wrong conclusions, I think, in the literature. Amato in 2003 made this statement about how uh, alternative currency um, comes, basically comes into existence when official money appears insufficient or functionally inadequate. Do people think Bitcoin came around because there's not enough U.S. dollars? I mean, that's what in essence he's saying there, which I think is ludicrous. And then um, most importantly, perhaps, is there's never been a full survey of all alternative currencies, both past and present. And that um, is important to answering questions like, why do alternative currencies fail? You need to study history to know this. So this is a picture of Zimbabwe. Uh, there was a New York Times article recently which talked about the coin problem in Zimbabwe. As you probably can imagine, Zimbabweans are not the wealthiest people in the world. And there's actually quite a few dollars circulating in Zimbabwe, dollar bills, that is. But 
there aren't very, very many coins, and so people will sometimes stand around at the grocery store waiting for some coins to show up so they can actually complete a transaction. Um, and this uh, problem has actually been a problem throughout history. Nobel Prize winning economist, economist Thomas Sargent wrote a book about this called The Big Problem of Small Change. There's always been this issue, it seems, uh, with, with not having enough small currency. Um, in the past, it was because it was too expensive to make it. It wasn't cost effective, actually, to mint small currency relative to large currency. Um, but it's still a problem we're dealing with today. So the other thing that this issue of small change, um, or the Zimbabwean example, raises is how do we define an alternative currency? This is this problem of not having a, a, um, an agreed upon definition. And do you want to include something like the US dollar in a country like Zimbabwe as an alternative currency? Um, I, I prefer a narrower definition. Um, and so my definition consists of three parts. First, that it is a medium exchange that is neither minted by a central government nor serves as official or de facto legal tender. So that's the definition I submit to you of what, what is and is not an artificial currency or alternative currency. And just to be clear, alternative forms of banking are not alternative currencies. We, we've heard M-Pesa mentioned here at this conference. This is the system in Kenya where people sending money basically through their mobile phones. Uh, that's all alt banking, that's not alternative currency. So there's really five types, different types of alternative currencies, I think, today. The first is uh, what I call open virtual, uh, Bitcoin, meaning you can basically spend it anywhere in the world that will take it. You've then got closed virtual, so think about a gaming currency, of course. You can use only in, say, a game. Merchant script, Amazon coins recently was announced. Commodity currencies, so different than M-Pesa is um, this, this use by Africans of, of actual SIM cards that have airtime minutes as a currency. So actually taking the SIM card and actually exchanging it for goods and services. And then last, community currencies, or what the folks in Brixton like to call complementary currencies. So the five key forces driving the proliferation, I think, of alternative currencies are ecological concerns, concerns about peak oil were very much a part of uh, what prompted Brixton to start its own currency. Um, there's a local initiative, uh, local merchants feeling that their, their shops are under threat by big box retailers um, pooling together to create community currencies. There's, of course, technological improvements, what Bitcoin is all about, um, real breakthroughs in, in software protocols. There's a dissatisfaction, the anti-banker reason for uh, people wanting to, of course, uh, have an alternative currency. And then last, and I think this is the really big opportunity, the really sustainable opportunity for Bitcoin, potentially, are inefficiencies in the global financial system. The current global financial system is very, very expensive. So just to conclude on the alternative, alternative currencies portion of the presentation, um, are, are alternative currencies money? Yes. Are today's alternative currencies ideal money? No. And then last, can alternative currencies become ideal money? And my answer to that is maybe not. Maybe not. And we can talk more about why that's the case later. This gets into, I think, more of a philosophical question about what is society's relationship with money? How much do you want to dis disconnect money, say, from a nation and or a state? So, so why do alternative currencies die? There's three ways in which I think they've typically died. One is by advances in technology. So in the UK, merchants faced with this big problem of small chains, change actually start issuing their own tokens. Um, right next to the LSE is the Lyceum Theater still. It's been there for, I guess, hundreds of years. They had their own token, which could be used to go see performances. Um, but when central banks like the Bank of England developed fiat money, they no longer had this problem of small change being too expensive to mint and goodbye merchant tokens. So that was a technological advance, arguably, arguably that did that. So the Let's scheme, which some of you may have heard of, is a barter scheme it started in the UK about 15 or so years ago, um, allowed people to exchange labor, basically, through this Let's currency system. And it's been in steady decline. It's, 
It had about 350 uh, uh, groups in 1995, and it's down to about 186 today. And I think it just really was not an efficient way of which to conduct business. I think that's what led. There was an initial kind of desire to want to do this. People were really excited. But kind of like a restaurant or a conference that starts to really kind of burn out, you know, the, the energy fades. And I think you've seen kind of let's fade in a similar fashion. And then the last uh, and probably most sinister way, <laughs> I've been sitting in on the regulatory panels today um, in which alternative currencies die, is through government action. And so I'm sure all of you or a lot of you are familiar with Freecoin, which was based on the Free Geld, which was a uh, currency that was issued by an Austrian town in the Great Depression to try to kickstart the economy. It features a holding cost, which I know is very controversial. Uh, it's the anti-deflationary approach to currency. And basically, the Austrian Central Bank came in and shut it down in 1933. Possibly, and this is why you go into economic, um, where you go into archives is, is to find out why the Central Bank really shut it down. Um, I've heard you know, it mentioned that the shilling or the, the, uh, the free gal looked too much like a shilling. Um, there may be other reasons that, that they, they felt threatened by this currency, and it would be interesting to explore that, which I, which I hope to do. So, so what can Bitcoin learn from other, other currencies? Um, there was this wonderful quote from uh, Wilco Brett, who's the owner of a brewery in Kreuzberg, Berlin. I don't know, is Wilco here? I hope he's not here. He might. Uh, I like the fact that Bitcoin scares people in suits because if this, if this thing were to really take off, it would bankrupt a lot of bankers. That is a wonderful way to get your name in the media, to, to come up with a, a really punchy quote like that. Um, we can go to the next slide. It's not, though, the best, I think, way of bringing the rest of the population, the mainstream population, uh, into the Bitcoin universe nor are tales of drugs or hiring people who can commit murder uh, on black market reloaded. I don't know if they can actually do that or not, but my point here is that Bitcoin really needs a story uh, besides this one, which is the one that when I get called by Sky News and Al Jazeera to go on television and talk about what can you do with your Bitcoins, that's what they want to ask you about. They're not asking me about, you know, what about Jagdish in London who's sending money back to his grandmother in Mumbai? and he's able to avoid these really expensive Western Union fees by using Bitcoin. That's the tale that needs to be told, not the anti-Baker tale, not this like negative tale. I think that's what Bitcoin needs to do to really come up with a compelling story for, for television. So the Brixton Pound, which I mentioned earlier, which is right next door, right next door to where I live, it's both a virtual and a uh, paper currency. That's the, the David Bowie tenor. Um, started five years ago, and uh, they, they call, they're very careful with their, their language, they're very smart how they're, they're, um, they're describing this, they're calling it a complementary currency. This currency is not meant to replace the British pound, it complements it. It's a way of encouraging things like, you know, the high street, the local businesses staying in Brixton. It's a, it's a way of keeping money in the community. Um, again, non-threatening language, I think, which is helpful. And there's two really, really interesting things about this currency and what they've able, been able to do in Brixton. First, local government officials, including the head of the Lambeth Council, actually take part of their salary in Brixton pounds. Government employees collecting salary in this currency. And second, you can pay local taxes and fees, some, with Brixton pounds. Imagine if you could pay your parking tickets with Bitcoin. Imagine if you could pay your utility bill. That's a compelling story. They've been able to pull that off. That's what Bitcoin needs. So just in conclusion, um, you know, we've talked about these, I think, throughout the presentation. The three big obstacles I see to you know, making bits, Bitcoin mainstream is, one, uh, you've got high switching costs. This is what I call my lovely wife, Molly, the Molly problem. I've been railing against too big to fail banks for years, and I still can't convince her to drop her Wells Fargo bank account. Convenience, people tell me about how con convenient Bitcoin is, but it's not as convenient as just whipping out your credit card and making payments right now still. Um, Got to make it more convenient. And then last, um, I think one way that Bitcoin could really 
be propelled into the mainstream is if there was something exclusive that, that you could only get with Bitcoins or something you could do. And this gets back to also, um, you know, our, our example of the, um, you know, the, the guy in London, Jagdish, trying to send money back to his grandmother, able to save huge, huge fees. You know, that kind of like unique way to um, compel people to make a change in how they do things. It's just amazing how resistant most people are to change. Obviously, no one in this room is, but especially with money, people don't like to make switches. So we need that exclusive, compelling story, I think, to really get people to want to adopt Bitcoin. Um, so just in conclusion, I'm going to be continuing my research. I'm collecting a ton of data, trying to build a database of all alternative currencies, uh, past and present. And um, thank you for your time. So would you say your background's more in macroeconomics or alternative currencies almost uh, from a historical standpoint? So I, I'm, I'm in the economic history department at the LSE. The reason I wanted to go into economic history, even though I'm interested in macro, is because uh, mainstream macroeconomics right now is a disaster, in my opinion. Um, it uh, is very politicized. Uh, models like the dynamic stochastic general, general equilibrium model, the DSGE model, which the Fed uses to uh, make decisions about how much money to print, don't work very well in terms of making accurate, predictable predictions. Um, and can't, macro can't answer questions like how much debt is too much debt. So, but good empirical work along the lines of what Reinhardt and Rogoff did with their This Time is Different book are really what inspired me to want to go into economic history. Okay. Yeah. So let me ask you my non-macro question then. Okay. <laughs> um, I was wondering if there's any data on adoption of Bitcoin uh, just generally. I know it's taking off in Argentina and I know they have experience with alternative currencies like the LED system. Um, mm -hmm. I know Greeks are experimenting with uh, a LED system, sort of an upgraded version of the barter clubs, but does anybody have, does anybody have accurate data on adoption? Uh, I, I, I personally don't, unfortunately, and I'd love to obtain it if anyone does. <laughs> uh, as well as accurate data on, there's, there's, two, there's two things that I would really like to know about Bitcoin in terms of data. One is what percentage of the um, turnover in Bitcoin is due to kind of real world goods and services transactions versus financial transactions. I've heard the ratio is five to one um, based on some source of financial to kind of real world transactions. And then um, the second question I'd love to know is uh, basically what goods can be bought both with Bitcoin and with say US dollars and uh, this is like the Big Mac index sort of that the economist publishes periodically looking at the price of a Big Mac and in, say India versus Switzerland to try to determine whether currencies are over or undervalued. Um, it'd be interesting to kind of see and create such an index if anyone is interested in a project like that. Yeah. Hi, uh, you spoke a bit about promoting the positive sides of Bitcoin uh, as opposed to the Silk Road tales. Um, what, as opposed to, sorry? Silk Road and, and yes. things like that. Uh, what do you think about using Bitco Bitcoin for um, funding charity? I think that sounds like a, it sounds easy to set up and it's really positive, uh, like in the minds of people. Yes, mm -hmm. I completely agree. I don't know if you saw the, uh, the Winklevoss twins' this presentation last night, but I thought they really, towards the end, really hit on this, you know, like the ways in which to start telling stories by sending money quickly to relief areas. Um, you know, Gavin's a great spokesperson for Bitcoin. Get him in front of the television uh, cameras and have him talk about it. Um, people will see a guy who's not uh, looking to, like, you know, destroy the Federal Reserve and bring back gold or digital gold. Um, so these are, I think, some of the images and 
yeah, ideas that I think can really get the story and narrative changed uh, on television where people's impressions are really, I think, still formed. Not on Reddit yet. <laughs> Um, I, when I was looking, uh, just researching on Bitcoin and where it might be going and looking for sort of hard numbers to back it up, I looked at uh, the uh, Swiss currency, the, the VER, mm. uh, used in an area of Switzerland. And uh, it's been around since about 1920 or so. Um, there was a shortage of their own currency at that time. I think maybe the, I don't know exactly why the shortage was there. I don't remember. Um, did you look at that currency? And what I find so interesting about that currency is that it seems very much like Bitcoin because mm. it is a ledger system. There are no bills or anything. It's an accounting system, which is what Bitcoin essentially is. Mm. And currently, the outstanding units of that currency, I think, is $5 billion. Um, and Bitcoin's at $1 billion. So that right there is sort of my first price target. What do you think about that currency? That's one I need to, to learn quite a bit more about, to be honest. I actually lived in Switzerland for a couple of years, did my master's in Lausanne. but. Um, uh, I have not taken a deep look at this. Now, Switzerland's got some interesting history here. Um, they, they shut down an alternative currency, I think, maybe 15, 20 years ago. That's another story that I'm trying to, to get my, my head around, like, why did they do that? Um, I don't know if this is the same currency that you're describing as I've, I've also heard, which is like a peer-to-peer -peer kind of lending scheme in Switzerland that's been around for 70 or 80 years. Is that? I didn't see any mention of that. Most okay. of my knowledge comes from Wikipedia, so yeah. <laughs> maybe it wasn't updated in 10 years, but... Uh, it's on my list know, to look at, it's, so... It's an accounting system is what's so interesting. I don't know that it's been shut down, but that's, uh, it provided a, a framework, and it's only one part of one small country. Yep. This is global. You can send someone money in 10 minutes, but the velocity of money is higher in Bitcoin, too, because of its electronic nature, mm -hmm. which might warrant a much lower market cap, to use an imperfect term. Mm. Um, I might be missing some of the context that uh, sort of led to the formulation of the speech in your mind, but um, why do you think we end up generating currencies you know, as human beings? And so what is it about our psychological decision-making infrastructure that forms that uh, way of doing transactions? Mm -hmm. right? What is it that pushes us uh, beyond barter? Mm -hmm. um, so. You mentioned one, as the third thing, um, the coincidence of double wants. Right. So that's one of the potential reasons. The other is to be able to make transactions exact. Mm -hmm. So in that context, so currencies arise, everything has relative value to each other. I don't quite see you know, if that's the reason why currencies arise. What is it about some currencies that they fail? That, you know, is there a link to the infrastructure in our minds and how we sort of self-organize with this economic system uh, that it no longer holds up and it fails. I could really see that. Mm. So if you could speak to that, that'd be great. It's a very deep uh, philosophical question. Any French philosophers in the audience who can help me with it? You know, I, hearing you ask about that, I thought of this book by David Graeber, 5,000 Years of Debt, which you might want to take a look at. I mean, he makes the case that basically debt predates money, um, that really in in pre-modern societies, people owed each other something. That, that was before money came around. Um, I don't know if I can really give you a great answer to your question other than this, I think you kind of answered it for yourself, frankly, with uh, you know, mentioning the double coincidence of wants problem and unit of account problem that, that money helps address. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I mean, fiat currency is going to be a tough act to compete with. I mean, you know, until you can start paying your taxes, you know, in a current, that's a huge competitive advantage. Um, you know, uh, how do you, how do you compete against that? You know, I mean, that's, you know, the, uh, I think another big question for Bitcoin you is how. Use Bitcoin to avoid the taxes, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, someone, someone made this comment that Bitcoin kind of allows the little guy to do what the big guy has been doing all along, right? Dodging okay. taxes. So there's another potential killer app for it, but yeah. Go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, from the perspective of uh, longevity for Bitcoin, do you think that um, the uh, deflationary nature is a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, it's probably uh, a good thing from, from a longevity perspective, but in terms of a, uh, you know, 
size perspective, you know, and like how big can Bitcoin get, it's it's going to be a problem um, because you're 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 trying to run a currency with one arm tied behind your back. Um, you know, gold still in theory could be a currency. There's nothing really stopping it from being a currency, other than the fact it's not a great currency um, relative to say fiat currencies, which have a lot more flexibility. Um, I mean, we could all be using gold right now. I know FDR banned it in '33, you know, yada yada. But um, if we all really, really didn't like fiat currencies, we could switch. I mean, that's the beauty of a currency, is that it's it's a belief-based system, and at any time people can change their minds and say, like they do in Zimbabwe, I'm not using a Zimbabwean dollar anymore. You know, in Argentina, I just found out that some unbelievable percentage of the U.S. dollars, printed U.S. dollars, are in Argentina because of um, the recent hyperinflation there. Um, where U.S. dollars tend to get exported to and stay are in places where there's been a recent case of hyperinflation. So people do switch their minds about currencies, but you know, if the bankers play, the, play their cards right, then it's, it's a tough, tough game to beat them at, um, especially if you have a deflationary currency because there are some disadvantages there. I'm curious if uh, in academia is Bitcoin, particularly in, uh, in the economics uh, schools, mm. is it being taken seriously or are you uh, on the fringe uh, <laughs> heretical element by, uh, by being there? Uh, so far as I know, I'm the best friend you guys have in academia. Um, <laughs> so be, be nice to me. Uh, if, you, if you read Paul Krugman's uh, blog, for example, I think he took a swipe at Bitcoin. Uh, you know, it's been incredible how anti-Bitcoin the acad academic establishment is. I mean, I, I'm from Silicon Valley. I have worked in startups, um, generally a positive, optimistic, you know, pro-technology kind of guy. And so I think this is very cutting edge and is something that's going to be, I mean, lead to something, I think, pretty significant. I think we're at a major turning point, potentially. Um, so, yeah, it, go easy on the academics. They're sometimes a little slower than in all of you, all right? <laughs> well, I guess it's better that you be, it's being dissed than ignored, if that's true. Yeah, I mean, you know, Bitcoin is threatening, you know, and it's new, and I think you're seeing a lot of basic kind of like, you know, human psychology come out, even among very highly educated people, you know, who are reluctant, you know, first they laugh, just like Tyler and Cameron said. Um, you know, if you, Federal Reserve is an incredibly powerful institution in economics. It employs a huge number of economists, uh, you know, there's a lot of vested interests, you know, of course, in not seeing any kind of major, major disruption to the status quo. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of academics, you know, are not a fan of Bitcoin. Uh, we're going to have to cut it off right there for the next right. speaker, but thank All you. Right. It was a great thank presentation. Thank you very much.